The case of the Rohingyas of Myanmar presents a situation in which the lands of a persecuted group are needed by land grabbing agencies, but the people are not. Usually eviction from land means that the dispossessed households become landless and have to find survival as wage workers through the labor market or shift to an alternative location where they can take up self-employment, for example, extracting resources from forests and fisheries. In many developing countries, there are instances of people who are evicted from land not being absorbed in wage employment, i.e. capital does not have any need for the labor. This has been termed dispossession without proletarianization in the Indian context, and comparable situations have been noted in South and Southeast Asia. However, the situation of the Rohingya Muslims in Rakhine or Arakan state of Myanmar is even more extreme, providing a limiting case. In addition to being evicted from ancestral lands, their subjection to extermination or expulsion implies that their very presence as producers, workers, consumers, and citizens is not wanted by the Myanmar regime. I, I want to stress this point. It is not the case that the evicted Rohingyas become landless workers available for employment. That set of options is not only foreclosed in terms of capital not needing their labor, but of the state not even needing their presence, uh, their very existence as either as whether as workers, producers, consumers, or citizens. Now this raises issues about how processes of grabbing land and primitive accumulation uh, uh, characterized uh, agrarian change in Myanmar in a very special way. This is a very complex question in the case of the Rohingyas, as I will explain now. Uh, the evic their eviction from their lands and their ensuing expulsion or extermination leads to several distinct trajectories with different theoretical implications, which I will lay out uh, uh, below in terms of three possible options. First, to the extent that the former Rohingya lands are redistributed to ethnic Buddhist Rakhines, who are also peasant producers, the agrarian structure is not qualitatively altered. Rather, what happens is that one group of, say, non-capitalist subsistence present producers is replaced by another, reflecting an ethno-religious recomposition of the peasantry without fundamental changes in production relations and the class structure. The second option, which is also something that the evidence on the ground shows, is that some of the Rohingya lands are taken over for construction of infrastructure and security installations, while some are taken over by the Burmese military and utilized to provision its troops or to provide private incomes to individual military officials. In other cases, the former Rohingya owners are still compelled to work the land but they have to hand over the produce to the military, typically without any remuneration for their labor. This also is not something that leads to capitalist production as such. It leads to surplus extraction by the military um, through use of coercion or the diversion of land to investment in security, in the security apparatus in terms of uh, installations for the military. Now, you know, in contrast to those, these two trajectories. The third trajectory, which is uh, also th theoretical significant here, is that the former lands of Rohingyas are reallocated by the government agencies, including one which is headed by Aung San Suu Kyi, for commercial production to business enterprises. These uh, business enterprises are typically uh, uh, called crony capitalists, and they're linked closely to military officials by kinship ties or other suited relationships. In such instances, the grabbing of Rohingya lands for subsequent deployment in capitalist production corresponds to a process of primitive accumulation. But note that this kind of primitive accumulation is to be distinguished from uh, Harvey's notion of accumulation by disposition in the sense that 
uh, accumulation by disposition uh, 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 is concerned with land grabs, which are supposed to lead to solutions to problems caused by the over accumulation of capital. This is not the case here. This is not a neoliberal uh, land grab in that sense, but very um, crude uh, ones uh, orchestrated to the needs of the military and its alliances in the business world. Now, these very trajectories following the eviction and expulsion of the Rohingyas from Myanmar constitute a limiting case with respect to the agrarian question of labor. It is not only that the labor of the Rohingya people is surplus to the requirements of capital, rather their very existence as social and economic agents is also not wanted. The Myanmar regime has little concern as to whether they remain alive and indeed has no hesitation about killing them directly or indirectly through varied forms of structural violence. The Rohingyas who are still remaining in Myanmar live in villages and camps that are subject to manifold restrictions on their rights and mobility, severely constraining their ability to earn incomes for subsistence, as well as access to other basic needs such as health, social welfare, and education. The Rohingyas evicted from the lands in Myanmar are thus confronted with a biopolitics that, to paraphrase Tanya Lee, is aimed at not only letting die, but also making die. Well, the fact that the Rohingyas expelled from Myanmar arrived as destitute refugees in Bangladesh, irrespective of whether they were rich or poor earlier, uh, this posed pressing questions about the prospects of their livelihoods and food security. Lacking any land and forbidden to work officially, they faced an impossible situation. In addition, one should note that in the agrarian structure of Bangladesh, there's a massive number, uh, proportion of landless who exist anyway. So the Rohingyas come into a situation where there is very little room for them because Bangladesh itself has its um, proletarian and semi-proletarian elements. Now, given this context, a section of the Rohingyas have been housed in social, in official refugee camps, which provided them with basic needs and food rations. While these handouts by the government, donor agencies and NGOs met the refugees basic needs through corporate food distribution channels, the food items were often inappropriate and inadequate in terms of cultural needs. The remaining refugees who were not in the camps sought shelter among the host population in the urban centers and rural villages of southeastern Bangladesh. Significantly, Rohingyas both inside and outside the refugee camps have flouted official restrictions and sought avenues of employment to earn income and meet food and other essential needs. In this endeavor, Rohingya men and women have offered to work for lower wage rates and accept harsher job conditions compared to their counterparts in the, lower, in the labor force of the host community. Moreover, Rohingyas have needed to ensure protection against local power holders making undue extortions from them or threatening to deport them back to Myanmar. So because of all of these considerations, Rohingya refugees have had to devise a general strategy of meeting survival needs and ensuring social protection by cultivating clientele styles with employers, traders, and officials, as well as developing mutual assistance networks among themselves involving processes of community formation uh, of a group of migrants in a new land. Over the years, despite lack of land and the right to work, the bulk of Rohingyas have sought and found avenues of wage work or self-employment outside refugee camps. Such efforts have largely provided them with food requirements for basic subsistence, often with greater dietary diversity compared to the food rations from the corporate food systems handed out to refugees in the camps.